my name is Bill McKibben, and this is a home movie that I shot on my uh, summer vacation, as it were, in Greenland, where I was doing some organizing from the front seat of a helicopter. It's going to last about two minutes and 40 seconds, which will be good. It'll keep me from talking any longer than I have to. And in a minute, you're going to see why I'm showing it to you. Uh, this is one of these fjords in Greenland at the end of one of these glaciers. Look, the climate crisis is not a theoretical or distant or abstract thing. It's something that's breaking over our heads right now. Um, in fact, we're at a moment in our political discourse when all of a sudden climate change is starting to come to the fore in a way that it rarely has before. Much of the reason for that is tragedy. Uh, the haunting pictures of 80 people dead uh, and probably more before they could flee their homes in uh, uh, the foothills of the Sierras, uh, pictures that um, we could show for every country on Earth now at this point. And some of it's simply because the science has become so inescapable. Uh, uh, these reports, first from the IPCC and then the national, the federal government over the last few weeks have brought home the fact that we're in a position of extraordinary danger facing the greatest crisis that humans have ever faced. Keep your eye on that uh, sort of outlying uh, piece of ice. That's 12 stories tall, 120 feet tall. And we just happened to be flying over it at the moment that it let go. Um, so those waves are 40 and 50 feet tall, crashing up from um, the fjord. And I, I show it to you just to bring to your consciousness the notion that that's happening now every second of every day someplace in the frozen parts of the world with enormous speed. Each time that it happens, uh, the ocean rises a tiny bit and uh, we get a little further along this curve. The point that I'm trying to make is none of the solutions that we're talking about with climate change are worth talking about if they take a long time to happen. Um, this is, a, this is a, a timed test, the really the first timed test that humans have faced as a civilization. And, and the time is actually extraordinarily short. So that said, it's a good thing that at this moment we're starting to see the beginnings of, of the response. And really in the last few weeks, we've watched uh, as this idea of a Green New Deal has entered public consciousness in a deeper way than it has before. People have been writing and thinking about various aspects of this for a long time, but all of a sudden, uh, 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 there's, there's something very uh, real there in front of us, and that's one of the ways in which we want to focus this talk today. So I'm going to begin, I'm going to introduce our panelists sort of as we go along and as I turn to them for questions. We're going to start uh, with Naomi Klein, who just wrote a terrific piece for The Intercept about the Green New Deal uh, uh, to kind of try and situate us. I, I said I was going to introduce you, so I will. Uh, uh, Naomi needs no introduction. Um, 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 the One of the greatest um, minds on the planet who's produced book after book that's changed the way we look at the world. Um, what more could one say? Um, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, uh, how this Green New Deal is emerging and what we should be kind of thinking about as we watch that process happen. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the first thing I would say is that there are lots of Green New Deals. You know, there isn't this one thing that is the Green New Deal. Um, there is momentum towards the idea of using the scarce time uh, leading up to 2020 to get as specific as possible about what a sweeping intersectional tra transition would look like if it took science and justice, seriously, if it embedded justice in the heart of the scientific imperative to get off of fossil fuels in this 
epic hurry, right? The IPCC report tells us we have a terrifying 12 years to reduce our fossil fuel use by 45%. And don't let your brain play a trick on you and tell you that that means you can start in 12 years. No, <laughs> by 12 years, we need to have be down by 45%. And by mid-century, we need to be off carbon completely, right? So that means we need to have started yesterday. Um, and this is, I think, why the 2016 election was so devastating to all of us who follow the science, right? And it was devastating to everybody for all kinds of reasons. But what all of us who follow the science know is that we just can't lose these four years, right? So I think what is so exciting about the momentum that is building towards creating a select committee, and this is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's proposal to create um, a select committee that would spend the next year consulting um, with movement leaders, um, including climate justice leaders who have come up with this whole model of embedding justice in, the, in our climate response, because for far too long, the truth is that the environmental movement didn't do that and didn't think enough about people and sort of had this um, idea that, you know, because climate change is so important, first we'll save the planet and then we'll worry about poverty and racism and gender exclusion. And you know, that's a way to build a really small, homogenous movement um, that is filled with privileged people who don't need transformative change. Um, and in fact, are very invested in the status quo, right? I mean, uh, Arundhati Roy, the wonderful novelist, talks about how a lot of environmentalists ask the question, how can we change without changing? Right? And if the status quo is working for you, that makes sense, right? Can we, can we do a little carbon trading? You know, can we, um, you know, can we change our light bulbs? Um, you know, how can, we, how can we change in a way that, dis th that, that disrupts a system that is working for me and my friends as little as possible, right? And I think the great wisdom of the environmental justice movement and the climate justice movement um, for all these years um, has been to say uh, that that actually the people who are, who are l the least threatened by the kind of systemic change that science is now demanding, and the IPCC report is very clear, and that the, just lest, lest we overlook it, they made it their very first line of the summary of the IPCC report, uh, that what is required now is transformation of every, of, of every aspect of society. In other words, a political revolution, right? Um, and you know, when I first started writing about the fact that capitalism and, and, and climate were in conflict, uh, I got a lot of pushback from our friends in the environmental movement who would say things to me like on the, on the down low, like, why are you making our jobs harder? You know, climate <laughs> change is hard enough. Well, why do we have to make it about capitalism? And my response was always, actually, capitalism isn't working for a huge number of people on this planet. And if we, can, if, if we can come up with a framework uh, for responding to climate change that is actually a challenge to economic inequality, joblessness, economic precarity, uh, the need for Medicare for all, and the rest of it, then actually we're going to build a much broader movement and also a movement that will fight harder because it has so much to gain. Because not only is it not threatened by systemic change, it's hungry for it, right? Um, so, in terms of your, you know, your question of where did this come from, I mean, frankly, I don't really know. Uh, um, you know it, it's come together really, really quickly. But I think the exciting part about the timeline, looking at the resolution, is that it, it sets a deadline of January 2020 to come up with a plan for a Green New Deal, right? That is a, all, uh, simultaneously a plan to virtually eliminate poverty a huge jobs program that touches on transfer, transportation, agriculture, energy, housing. Um, and this is the problem with the way we've traditionally dealt with climate change, I think, in the past, is that it has been so siloed. Um, and you know, we're always looking for that sort of magic bullet. And so this creates a framework for all of these different sectors to talk together. I think by using the phrase New Deal, it reminds us that there is a historical precedent for responding to right. collective crisis um, with transformational change. But it should also be a reminder um, that 
that first New Deal didn't have enough justice embedded in the center um, by any means. And there were many people who were excluded by design, many African-American workers. You know, the 30s were a period when a huge number of Mexicans were deported um, to eliminate competition from white workers in the United States. Domestic workers were excluded from so many New Deal era policies, agricultural workers. So this New Deal has to be not only green, but for everybody, right? And, and so, so you've got this timeline, which conveniently is at the beginning <laughs> of the 2020 cycle. Um, and if there is you know, a truly participatory process that draws on the wisdom of these movements that have been developing this idea for so long, um, and the local governments that are already trying to build it in miniature, um, and the best scientists, and, and all the best knowledge, and the best practices around the world, then that means that there could be a plan that really it comes from this interplay between uh, movements working from below and this exotic thing of having a, a, a critical mass of politicians who are not afraid of, of, of transformational change. Um, and it could form the basis of a people's platform in 2020. And any candidate who wanted to run as a progressive would need to run on the Green New Deal. That, and that, to me, is exciting. So that's, I mean, I think that's really powerful. <laughs> I, I, I think we're... We're sort of witnessing the moment when, uh, uh, when the Green New Deal sort of takes its place as a kind of slogan organizing idea, whatever, alongside the $15 minimum wage as a response to inequality and Medicare for all as a response to the kind of just precariousness of life in our modern economy. Matt Nelson. I, if, to, if there are people here who don't know Matt's work, you should, and you should be following it and paying attention to it. He runs Presente.org, which, I, for, for lack of a better comparison, you could say is a kind of Latinx uh, uh, move on with some color of change and uh, other things kind of thrown in. A great organizer uh, uh, who has... Uh, his, his, who has an ear both for kind of movements and for the political uh, hurly-burly into which they have inevitably to descend. Matt, tell us a little bit more about where it feels like this came from and where it seems to be going and, and, and how you think about it as a kind of maturing political idea. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Um, thank you, uh, my fellow panelists, who are also colleagues and comrades in this struggle. Really want to appreciate the Sanders Institute, the National Nurses, the um, Healthy Housing Foundation as the sponsors. Um, yes, freedom and unity. Go Vermont. <laughs> Go Vermont. It's the state That's motto. Right. Freedom and unity. It, you know, I, I was heartwarmed when it, you know, coming from, I came from Oakland, but coming from Wisconsin, where our motto is forward. Um, freedom and unity is, is, is pretty awesome, too. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Andrew Kopkind, um, who, you know, his work really introduced me to Vermont and the Take Back the Landers. And we're here in a place where they prepared for massive social transformation. Massive, the potential of actual social movement revolution. Folks laid the groundwork to prepare here. And if you like things like Democracy Now!, if you like things like The Intercept, you should really be keyed into folks like, like Andrew Kopkind and those who were, who were moving journalism in a, in a, in a very transformative way um, out of Vermont. So I just want to make sure we're rooted a bit in this place. I also want to give a, a love, so much love to the nurses. My, yes, yes. I do this work because of a nurse. I do this work because I was inspired by my mother who was a nurse. And I watched her organize to keep uh, members of my family alive. And that's how I learned organizing. That's how I learned about power. It was from a nurse, and it was, it was, you know, so love to my mother and love to the nurses. Um, it makes me know that when the leadership 
just like when the leadership is young people, when the leadership is women of color, when the leadership of nurses, we know we're in the right direction. So um, thank you for that. Um, yes, and um, in terms of part of where we approach it from the Latinx community, and Presente represents a half million people around the country who are committed to building power, changing culture, and how we like to say it, stay Presente. And one of the ways we recently got involved was around uh, Dia de los Muertos, which is a, a, a very important holiday in, in, in the Latinx community. And part of how we wanted to honor ancestors, honor the lives of people who came before us was talking about climate change and talking about migration related to climate change. And so we set up with uh, the California-based 800 group plus group coalition, Brown's Last Chance. We set up an altar, a Dia de los Muertos altar at the state capital of California. And, and set a public challenge. No new fossil fuel permits, keep it in the ground, phase out existing, and make a commitment, a down payment on this Green New Deal to say, we won't have drilling next to schools. No child should go to a school next to an oil rig or should be polluted in their homes. Like At the very minimum, we have to start phasing out all of this deadly extraction from the places where, where, where we live. And it is about racial justice. Climate crisis is about um, economic rights. It is about migration. And so, you know, folks, as we lean into this, have to have an intersectional frame on this. Like, you have to go, go back and look at your Kimberly Crenshaw and study up on intersectionality and how we're actually going to make this work um, work for us. Talk just a little bit more. Uh, you, you brought it up um, about migration. Um, we're watching now the kind of spasmodic, convulsive response to a few thousand people appearing on the border. But climate scientists are pretty clear that we're likely to see hundreds of millions of people on the move by the middle part of this century as it gets too hot to farm, as the sea rises past people's door threshold, you know, so on. Um, um, are, there th are there things that, we, as we're starting down this work of things like the Green New Deal, are there ways that we should be kind of thinking about, thinking this through right from the start? Definitely, definitely. And, you know, part of being rooted in, in a people of color perspective, in a Latinx perspective, is in the Green New Deal, Latinx people will refuse to be bracetos in the new economy, even if it's green. Will refuse to do jobs that kill us while creating a horrible future for our children. And when I think of, of major immigration policy, Yes, I think of all the horrible things that we see in the news every week, but I think of NAFTA. NAFTA was one of the, was one of the cornerstone um, immigration policies that was rooted in white supremacy and corporate domination. And so, yes, we have to talk about migration, and we also have to understand that, that new deals are stopped when you know, they, they, they form when there's social movement, when there's actually people power. They are stopped and halted when there is this nexus of corporate domination and white supremacy. I do think about, you know, not only after Hurricane Katrina, what we could have done in terms of mm -hmm. a Green New Deal, but I think about, about just the 10 short years of reconstruction before Jim Crow and before um, corporate personhood started in 1886, you know, and then the 14th Amendment became this, this, this counter wave to what could have been a transformative time in society um, for, the, for, the, for the positive. So, so when you think about migration, you got to think about people, and, and social movements are what drive these policies forward. And we always talk about, well, you know, climate crisis is a, is a human-made crisis. 
And I would actually say that, that it's a person-made crisis, and it's, it's made possible by corporations who have personhood. So that's, it's got to be part of the conversation, as does racial justice, as does global migration. Thank you. So Abdul, ground us a little bit. Abdul El Said has many, uh, you know, many things on his resume that are worth noting. He was a Rhodes Scholar, and he ended up uh, running the public health department in Detroit. But his most recent experience is running a feisty and powerful campaign for governor of Michigan, where he was talking about. And he was talking about taking some of the, and he was talking about these issues straight on. Talk a little bit about what the, what a Green New Deal looks like in Detroit, but also in, you know, in the suburbs, in yeah. Bloomfield Hills, or, you know, how, how does it play out? So I just want to uh, thank the Sanders Institute for the space. Um, also, my, my mother is a nurse. My grandmother was a nurse. <laughs> nurses got me through med school, so uh, thank you to the nurses. And... Um, you know, I, if you've ever been in a hospital, you know that the people who take care of you are the nurses, they're not the doctors. And, um, and so uh, it is right that the nurses would be moving toward Medicare for All and dragging the doctors along with them. And uh, my hope is that we can get some of those doctors there with you. Um, I, I just want to situate this, this locally in Detroit, right? Because they, if you want to understand great policy, Great policy does the work of solving problems for real people. Oftentimes when we think about policy, we're, we're often optimizing to an idea. We're optimizing to a trend, but not optimizing to real people. And I think if you want to understand the effects of a tree, whether it's a tree of goodwill or a tree of poison, the effects of the tree are going to be most profound at the roots. And I think the root of the various policy ideas that are packed into this Green New Deal they sit in a community like Detroit. And I want you to imagine if you were a small child, a little girl, let's say you're three years old, and your mom or dad just got laid off because GM shut down a plant at the edge of Detroit and Hamtramck, 1,500 jobs lost, which by the way had been built over top of a community, a multi-ethnic community called Pole Town 30 years ago. They actually had to physically lift five women in a paddy wagon so that the bulldozers could start building at that last minute to build that, that plant. Now, in Detroit, the probability of being hospitalized for asthma is threefold the rest of the state. If you have mild persistent asthma, you're likely to miss at least one school day every two weeks. Why don't you think what that is? And it's not because you got to stay home and play video games. It's because you could not breathe that morning and you had to be rushed to a hospital. And the reason why is because Detroit is the epicenter of most of the biggest carbon emitting plants in the entire state of Michigan. A Marathon Petroleum Refinery probably sits within two miles of that three-year-old girl's home. And that petroleum refinery, they're the biggest single emitter of sulfur dioxide in the entire state. The EPA has ruled them to be in what's called non-attainment. So when we talk about the climate change epidemic, let's think about the roots and the roots are in those communities where this climate is released and the consequences are babies who can't go to school because they cannot breathe. And then from there, ask yourself about why GM got to build that plant that employed that kid's parent because they got huge levels of corporate subsidies from the state, from the city, and from the federal government. And then they shut down. And by the way, because they built out of Detroit, they built the entire infrastructure of the state of Michigan around what? The car. And so there is no public transit in, this, in the city of Detroit. So the high likelihood is that that kid has to get into a car to go even two miles. And you know what? In Detroit, 40% of Detroiters don't have a car. The cost of auto insurance is five-fold the state average. So when we talk about a Green New Deal, the reason that this is so resonant is because it speaks to the experience of real people. It speaks to the fact that what is driving climate change is exactly that output from those plants that is poisoning those kids. It speaks to the fact that we need to rebuild an infrastructure that is clean around the experience of people who cannot get from place to place because we built our infrastructure all wrong in the post-World War II era. And it speaks to the fact that right now this corporate subsidized system of job creation has failed 
low-income people for the most part, either because they're underemployed or because those businesses realize that because of, because of globalization, those, those companies are going to up and leave, and you cannot, you cannot rely on those jobs. So that Green New Deal sits at the lived experience of that kid. And the fact of the matter is, you don't have to be in Detroit to see why this matters. Because if good policy is about situating about real people, good politics is about empowering people to see themselves in those shoes. And so when you talk to folks in Traverse City, they know about the Line 5 oil pipeline that sits in the Straits of Mackinac between Lake Huron and Lake Michigan, that if it burst, would burst into 10% of the world's fresh water. They know about that. And every time there's a scare because an anchor dropped too close, they know what that would look like in their homes. They're not that kid in Detroit. They're folks who we'd call suburban or rural. When you talk to folks about PFAS in our water, or more importantly, the Flint water crisis, which is a crisis of infrastructure, which has created the poisoning, mass poisoning of children, who, by the way, happen to be low income and disproportionately black. And so I think when, when we talk about this issue, it's really important to ask ourselves when we validate policy and politics, does it actually situate a real person? And is that the person suffering? And do, does the message actually pull people into that frame so that they can see the world from somebody who suffered? And that's the reason I think this Green New Deal has been so effective. Our campaign ran on part of it. I'm really proud that um, one of the key architects of the policy is my former policy director, Rihanna Gunwright. You'll hear that name many, many times in the future. Incredible, young African-American woman who is, I think, going to be a huge policy engine for a progressive future. But that's being erected out of a set of ideas that we actually beta tested on the campaign. Because when you sat down and you talked to suburban folks and you said, hey, look, you have to actually sit in your car 30 minutes to get to work. Do you like doing that? Most of them said no. And when you asked them about what the consequences probably were for the environment, they all understood. And they understood that the infrastructure that we had built around this entire way of life, that that infrastructure was crumbling and we had not invested in rebuilding it. Instead, instead we were investing in giving corporate subsidies to corporations like GM so that they could up and move when they realized that it was a better bet for them to invest in China. And so I think it's really important for us to always focus our message around a policy that's focused on the people we want to serve. So that's, that's, that seems just right. We've, so we've outlined the fact that we're in a really deep crisis and that that crisis has created a real opportunity for change, not just in things environmental, but that, that to use as a lever for changing on a very large scale. Uh, some of the work that Naomi was thinking about when the Leap Manifesto was written and things. The, uh, uh, I can almost predict that the one of the responses, since we're past the point where it's, for anyone except Donald Trump, credible to pretend that the climate isn't changing or that it isn't a problem or whatever. Um, my guess is that the most common response from people who don't want to do this is going to be, well, it's a good idea, but boy, that's going to take uh, all the money in the world and we can't afford to do it, which is why I'm very glad that we have Stephanie Kelton with us, um, uh, professor of economics at Stony Brook, but really, most importantly, uh, the, the chief translator uh, uh, for the public of this uh, emerging uh, field of modern monetary theory. Um, um, Stephanie, is this, I mean, is this beyond our ability to think on this scale? Should we be thinking uh, uh, small instead? Or is this actually uh, something that, that could be made to square with the economics of the world that we inhabit? Thank you. Um, I'm really happy to be on this panel with these esteemed uh, individuals and have an opportunity to answer a question that I think is so important because, as you said, the, the question is, how are you going to pay for it all, right? It's going to cost a lot of money to do this. And so I had a piece in Huffington Post this morning with uh, Greg Carlock and Andres Bernal, and it answers this exact question. And I think we called it, we can't afford a Green New Deal. So. I guess I would start by saying, how did, how did we do the New Deal? Because the New Deal happened at a time when the US was experiencing perhaps the most miserable economic downturn in its history, right? The Great Depression. 
So you say, all of a sudden, here's this country where people in mass are losing jobs, 25% of the population officially unemployed, incomes collapsing, farmers losing their farms, right? Everything is dire and desperate. And the government goes around and collects a little bit of the money that remains in order to pay for a new deal. Of course not, right? That is not what happened. What did the government do? They mustered the power of the purse. That's what they did. Government went off the gold standard. FDR understood this. He understood that in order to engage in a really ambitious program to fight against the Great Depression, that they couldn't do this on a gold standard, where you literally have to find the money. Like, you go find gold, right? And he said, we're not going to mess around with this. We've got to get off this system. We need to free ourselves. And so that's what they did. And they end up with the kind of monetary system we have today, which is one that provides all of the flexibility that is necessary for Congress to draft legislation. If there's anyone in the room who doesn't believe that if the House and Senate wanted to do so, they could sit down and write a budget and put resources into the kinds of things we're talking about to transform this economy before it's too late. Everything from transportation to agriculture. We were talking about this behind the scenes. This is a moonshot. This is a big, ambitious thing that we have got to do, and the clock is ticking. Congress could sit down, write a budget, dedicate resources, pass the budget, and what would happen? It would all be paid for. That's it. Do, do you think that's not how it works right now? <laughs> do you think the Republicans don't understand this? Because the Republicans understand very well that there aren't these kinds of constraints that can prevent you. If you they, they are very good, right? Let's make no mistake. They are laser focused on where they want to go. And they don't let a lot of uh, distractions and concerns about paying for things and deficits and all this kind of stuff, they go, uh, you know, fingers in the ears, and I'm, I'm not hearing you, I, I have an agenda, I'm going there, and I'm laser focused on getting there. And none of this other stuff slows them down, but when it comes to the left, somehow, very often, these things become, sort of in, we allow them to become insurmountable obstacles. And we say, well, but we have to play by this set of rules, and we have to find pay-fors for everything, and we have to respect the deficit because it will feel really bad if, if the deficit goes up, you know, that's going to hurt, the, that will hurt the deficit. What about the planet? What about our communities? <laughs> right? Our priorities are completely out of whack. So these are some of the sorts of things I argued in this piece. Our government issues the US dollar. That's the point, right? They literally have the monopoly on the creation of our currency. They can't run out of it. They're never going to go broke. It's the rest of us who need the currency, right? We all use the dollar. They issue the dollar. So they can write a budget, pass a budget, and everything will be funded. Look, it's not me. It's Alan Greenspan. Remember them? <laughs> Alan Greenspan, right? He knows where the money comes from. He was chairman of the Federal Reserve. Alan Greenspan says, these are his words, not mine, there's nothing to prevent the federal government from creating as much money as it wants and paying it to someone. <coughs> Again, the Republicans understand this, okay? This is Alan Greenspan. How does he know? Because his job at the Fed was to make sure that whatever payments Congress had authorized always got cleared by the government's bank, the Fed. They don't bounce government checks. It's their job to make sure that doesn't happen. So the finding the money is the, is the least critical question that we can be asking. We have to find the votes. That's how you pass legislation, and that's how you pay for and fund things. Congress goes around and looks for the votes. Nobody's looking for money. They're looking for the votes. Naomi. I mean, I, I find it obviously really exciting to think we could <laughs> do this without you know, cutting. To, but I also do worry that the kind of extreme economic inequality that we have right now is a huge moral hazard when it comes to climate change. And that I really do think that it has gotten so extreme that, we, that part of what we are up against is not climate change denial. It's that we have a class of oligarchs who think they're rich enough to protect themselves from climate change. And um, I want, 
I want to tax the hell out of them. Oh, you, you can. Know. I do too. <laughs> Not because I also you... want to take money from the military because I don't want that to be war. Here's the point. Here's the point. Naomi, okay. we're together. All right. All right. We're okay. together, but I think these fights have to be decoupled. I think they have to be decoupled. You tax the rich because they're too damn rich. And you want to bust up concentrations of wealth and income that are disruptive, not just to the functioning of our economy, but to the functioning of our democracy. democracy. Mm -hmm. So in fact, if you were doing it my way, I think you'd end up raising taxes much higher than if you were just trying to peel off a little bit of money to fund some government program. You're taxing with purpose. And same with defense. You don't say, well, I have to carve out this bit of money from over here so that I can transfer it, as if there's a finite amount of money that the government can spend. And if you want to put more in this line item of the budget, you have to carve something out here. You don't. Mm -hmm. But there are good reasons to carve it out. Right. And I think you just have to have separate fights. But uh, there's one, if there's one other thing I just throw in is that I think you know, I think the idea behind the Green New Deal framework, you know, whether we're talking about a particular uh, select committee or we're talking about this broader uh, climate justice movement that has been making this argument for a huge time, and one thing I, f for a long time, and one thing I would say is that if we don't want to waste time we don't have, we have to not reinvent the wheel. And there's a huge amount of wisdom to draw on. Um, whether, we, whether it's the Climate Justice Alliance here in the US, whether it's Junta Gente in Puerto Rico, which is a coalition of 60 uh, you know, movements that came together in the aftermath of, of Maria to come up with a people's platform to do battle with the disaster capitalists in Puerto Rico and have been having town halls across the archipelago. We need to draw on that. Um, on that knowledge, there's a LEAP LA uh, a coalition um, in Los Angeles that has come up with a framework for a climate emergency mobilization department uh, in, in LA. And you know, they have done that hard work of coalition building. It's, it's tough, right? We've all got a, a lot of history and screw ups and you get in a room together. You know, we, 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 we can't act as if this is starting now. We have to draw on all of this and much, much more if we're going to proceed with, 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 with the velocity that, 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 that the, this crisis demands well, so that in 2020, you know, if we are in the best case scenario of taking the White House and the Senate, you know, on day one, we go into hyperdrive, so, right? So one of the things that's worth thinking about uh, along those lines is, they don't call it global warming for nothing. Um, you know, uh, even if we could figure out a way to deal with this problem in the United States, it doesn't do us an immense amount of good if we're doing that alone. Um, we assume there's a certain kind of leadership factor or something that, but, but you've spent a lot of time, and some of the rest of you, uh, Matt and others, thinking about uh, the larger world too. And we have people like Giannis from, uh, you know, who've been working hard on, on these questions around austerity in Europe and things. Um, uh, is there a, uh, is there some place for thinking about, the, I mean, uh, look, uh, uh, as long as we're, um, as long as we're thinking big, um, uh, is there some room for thinking about this globally uh, mm -hmm. too? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I can start. Um, I was born in Colombia, grew up in Minnesota, which makes me a proud Minolumbian. <laughs> <laughs> and, I've, and I've seen, I've been paying attention, like after the peace accords, how much um, civil society in Colombia has really advanced this conversation around their own Green New Deal and around like taking back power in terms of shaping what happens next with the green economy, whether it's wind, or solar, but it's essentially, take, it's essentially taking back the commons and taking it out of the, the war economy, out of the like gangster economy, and back into what would that look like? And, and I want to actually like continue on the money um, aspect of this a little bit, because oftentimes when we, when we do our movements, we talk about wages or income. We don't fight over wealth. And right now, the biggest oil companies in the world are fighting over, they understand the wealth of the green economy. The wealth, they know it's going to transition. You know, they, they know that, that, you know, fossil fuels are over. And they want to control the next economy. They also know we're in the next economy. And so I think it's instructive 
you know, when, when we have these, um, you know, when, when Amazon's like, okay, we're going to pay workers a little more, and at this, the next day, we're going to set up Amazon stores that have no people. Because they're fighting over wealth, and we're fighting over income. And, and in this Green New Deal, we have to shift wealth and, and make sure that we own it, that we run it, that we leverage it, because that's also how wealth is made, by leveraging wealth. You know, it was, it's Dick Gregory that said, the, the richer you are, the less you work. Rich folks don't work because they have wealth. And I think that, that and rich corporations leverage their wealth to create wealth. And, and, and we're, so in, if th this Green New Deal, it's not just talking about jobs. Like it has to talk about things that it's yeah. starting to talk about, universal basic income. You know, wh when I think about healthcare for all, I think about, oh, that's a, a, a redistribution of wealth. That's like a wealth creating um, um, scenario. I think we have to look at it the same. And I feel like there's places around the world that we can look to that as we're rebuilding, um, it, we, we can really look to what, what do we actually need to shift and control beyond getting a, a transitioning my job. No, it's like let's transform our neighborhood and let's own it in the future in trust because we'll do a much better job than the Chevrons and the BPs of the world who it's remarkable that their name is Beyond Petroleum. <laughs> like that should signal what they intend to do with our, you know, new green new deal. So interesting, my, my family's from the Middle East and uh, my, my father immigrated from, from Egypt. And um, Egypt is, is the second biggest recipient of military aid. And when we talk about military aid, it's interesting because the test case for modern monetary theory is actually the military. And what a lot of folks don't realize is that is a glorified jobs program because mm -hmm. what we give to Egypt are tanks that are manufactured in the United States. Mm -hmm. That's how this thing works. And one of the biggest recipients of our military aid happens also to be one of the world's biggest producers of oil. And what we're talking about right now is a system where instead of actually leveraging this approach to thinking about what a Keynesian economics can do in a moment for Americans, what we're doing is using it to protect oligopolies by financing and feeding a system of making war in the United States to ship abroad. And, 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 and we've seen that interrupt our approach to, to foreign policy in some profound ways. Because if you look at the Egyptian, the Egyptian economy, something like 20 to 30% of it is just leveraged military. Military owns farms. The military makes bread. The military does almost everything. And the reason why is because the military is the single biggest arm that analogs to us. And when people were protesting in 2011 to actually agitate from their freedom from military dictatorship, where were we? Like, oh, this kind of benefits us. We, we don't want to interrupt the jobs program in Ohio, right? And so thinking about this from an international setting, we, we are actually leveraging this system of economics to subsidize war in the world so that we can empower people to create weapons of war rather than leveraging this system of economics to actually create jobs for people at home that actually free us from the consequences of climate change and rebuild the infrastructure that is, by the way, really lagging. Mm -hmm. so, so this is... This has been a, this has so far been a really remarkable discussion, and I think I'm just going to try and situate us here before we take some questions. Um, I mean, what one is, what we're hearing, and it should be exciting to everybody, is the idea that there's a lever at hand uh, that one can pull that to use Naomi's phrase, uh, it might change everything, um, in a sense. And it's a lever that we have no choice but to pull, because if we don't, then, well, then the temperature of the Earth's gonna go up seven, eight, nine degrees Fahrenheit, and that's gonna be that. Um, and, and so keep that tension you know, in mind. This isn't like, all the other political discussions that we have, which in the end boil down to uh, fights between different groups of people over 
uh, who's going to you know who's going to have more of what and so on. There's definitely a big element of that here, but in the background of it, there's the irreducible uh, negotiation that's going on between human beings and physics at the same time, and that's not a negotiation to which you know uh, that physics is interested in where it is in the business cycle or you know so on and so forth physics just does what physics does that's the thing that keeps us honest in this discussion at all times so let's let's open the floor here to questions everybody in here is used to i'm just looking around you're all used to speaking and all of this so you know that the uh, most useful thing to do when you're asking questions is actually to ask question. Um, 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 and I believe, David, there are microphones where you want us to, or are you going to carry it around? Or? Somebody coming. And, well, I got all right. And, and, and Bill, if I could say, just Matt. reflect on our pre-conversation. Yes. Is that, is that this Green New Deal, it's, it's very exciting. You know, much love to the young folks who've really showed us the Sunrise way Sunrise movement, especially. Yeah. It's, it's extremely um, a wonderful opportunity to shape it into the transformational policy and, and, and shift the culture around this that creates a systemic change that we need and deserve. And that comes from social movements. So overall, our social movements need to be in a place to help shape this in a positive way, here, here. knowing that the other side strategy is to smash it. Yes. Mm -hmm. here, here. So we need to shape it so they can't smash it. Right mm -hmm. All right. All right. Questions, questions with a question mark occurring at the end of them. All right. John. Go, going forward, how do, how do we kill free market orthodoxy theology? Because as I think about all this brilliant stuff I'm hearing, I think both political, the dominant political parties, um, as soon as you say this, they say, we're all for it. Now let's look for some free market solutions, which is more capitalism to stop climate change. So how do we finally kill that hydra that we cannot kill? Um, that's my question. Stephanie, you take a first crack at this question. Well, I mean, the. They're the problem, not the solution. Um, how, do you, how do you successfully persuade, mm -hmm. as someone I once worked for likes to say, it, change is not going to come from the top down. It's going to come from the bottom up. So it's going to take a mass, critical mass of people saying capitalism is the problem, not the solution to where we are. I reject all this free market stuff. We're not going to do cap and trade isn't going to save us, right? All this sort of stuff. But who, who understands that well enough to push back and to demand a public response on the magnitude of something like a mass mobilization for World War II? Because that's what this is going to take. It has to be government, and it has to be massive intervention to reshape the way we do things across so many industries. I just want to add, I, I also think the, the solution, and I hate to say it, but the reductive solution to almost every problem we face is probably campaign finance reform. And the reason yeah. why, um, yeah. you know, in this case, uh, I'm working on this small analysis of, of looking at why we're all of a sudden seeing politicians running for, uh, running on Medicare for all and, um, and succeeding. And that's largely because Frankly, you know, I think Senator Sanders' leadership on Medicare for All is amazing. A, but the bigger contribution to Medicare for All was not raising Medicare for All. It was running without taking any corporate money. Because if you're not taking corporate money, you are free to actually say what matters because you're raising money from people who actually care about you rather than people who want to use you when you're in office. And, and in this case, right, the reason it matters so much is because the reason all of these Democrats and Republicans are looking for these same market answers is along the lines, I don't know if you've read uh, Winners Take All by Anand Giridharadas. I think it's a fantastic read. And his argument is that they basically posited, these corporations and the people who run them have posited themselves as the answer in good times and bad. And in bad times, they then want to be the answer and the market's going to solve it all. 
Well, look, if, if you're not taking money from those corporations, then at some point you're like, you know what, the bullshit about you all being the answer is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And so we can move past that and actually start thinking about the kind of real dig deep answer. Um, and so I, I hate to say it, it does come back to, to campaign finance so, and, reform. And one way, of, one way of saying that is in the short run, as we're working on campaign finance reform, one of the things that people at groups like Sunrise Movement have done so well is highlight, <coughs> either highlight those politicians who have refused to take fossil fuel money or mm -hmm. call out those who won't. Yeah. And I think it's safe to say that uh, no one running for uh, office in 2020 should expect uh, any love from the progressive community if they've decided that they want some money from Exxon too. I so I, I, I think that one's, that one actually is at this point an easy call now. Mm -hmm. um, and and speaking forward. of Exxon, which I think another tactic is, we need to, to, to create intense political pain for some of these corporations. Like we need to make an example out of some of these corporations. Yeah. I think Exxon's a great one. That could actually be uh, dechartered or taken out. Um, they shouldn't be in business anymore. When I think about how close we were as a movement to eliminating some of the largest tobacco companies on the planet, when they admitted, hey, we're killing people and targeting children and killing children, and they were almost dissolved. Mm -hmm. And so we have to see the political imagination around like, what is a world without Exxon? Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and so that's got to be part of it. Yes, campaign finance reform. Yes, uh, addressing the, the, the incredible power of corporation. But one of the ways to do that is to knock some of these giants down. Absolutely. And, and I'll just tell you the piece of good news, which is that the uh, divestment campaign, which Naomi helped kick off, um, uh, just has passed in the last few days the seven trillion dollar mark around the world with uh, and and <laughs> Goldman Sachs Goldman Sachs in one of its uh, analysis two weeks ago uh, attributed uh, attribute, said that the divestment campaign had dropped the value of coal stocks sixty percent around the world mm -hmm. so that kind of, I mean what you're talking about is, by no means impossible or even aspirational, it's beginning to happen. So that's good news. Who else? I, I actually can no longer see anybody. So, okay, you've got a question. You, you've got the mic, so you can tell us who's coming next. There we go. And Hi. tell us who you are. As you... Hi, it's Hosnia. Hi, I'm, uh, I spoke earlier on Medicare for All. I'm from the UK, another doctor and a, and a labor counselor and campaigner. So I'm really interested to hear what you all have to say about intersectionality because when you look at Oxford is actually, I live in near East Oxford and there's a lot of um, activists on this issue but almost exclusively white and in the UK that generally is still the case and I really would like to hear how you move on the conversation and get intersectionality into this issue and then secondly um, being from Iran, I do really think that there is a conversation around the high income and low and middle income countries and it's how do we equate those issues because low income countries will say, well, you know, you're already developed, et cetera. So that comes round and round all the time. So I'd like to let's, have some thoughts so on let's talk. So first one first, Matt, you probably have better numbers than I do on this, but in this country, uh, uh, the, the, the people who are most worried about climate change uh, are Latinx voters followed by African Americans, followed considerably by uh, white people uh, in America. That's correct, yeah? And, the and I think the, with the demographic shifting, you know, 900,000 Latinx people in the US turn 18 each year. And so it, it's the, the amount of political power and concern and proximity to climate crisis for black and brown communities puts it immediately in the what we care about zone. And, and I actually think a good start for folks is the race class narrative analysis that Demos did and Anat Chankarsario did um, around this issue of you can, we can, so we can have nice things. We can talk about climate and race at the same time. You know, and then when, when I see, you know, some of these things, and, and we can shift our language from, from, from just an add-on, 
Like, this is really bad. And it's worse for Latinx folks. And it's worse for black folks. Like, we have to stop that. We have to talk about how these policies are inherently racist and white supremacist. And then if we're in this, and, and that we can only solve them together. And so I, I think that there's, some, that there's some ways to shifting how we talk about this. And, and all, you know, the, the panels have done great work in not just talking about climate change, but talking about climate crises, you know, really shifting how we talk about things is an invitation to shift power to the most impacted, knowing that, that this part of the secret weapon here is culture. And if we shift culture, we create systemic change. And, we, and, and when we just focused on getting people to agree with us, we're going to lose. Being right is not the way to win. Getting people to care and then getting people to take deeper action is how we win. And we only do that through cultural power, through intersectionality, and through like talking to each other in real ways that are humble and kind. Mm. Naomi. Well, I was just going to very quickly um, add that I think that in Europe right now, the rising xenophobia, rising far-right fascism, whatever you want to call it, um, I think it needs to be connected more explicitly with the climate crisis. And I would, I would argue that these, the two kind of biggest stories of our time are the same story. Um, it, 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 which is not to say that climate change is the only thing fueling migration, but I would make the argument that even if it's only on a subconscious level, everybody on this planet knows that we are entering an era where many, many, many more people are going to have to move. We already have more people on the move than at any point since the Second World War, and it is not going to slow down because we know that climate change is an accelerant to all of the other forces that are forcing people to move, whether it is you know, crop failure intersecting with failed free trade policies or climate change acting as an accelerant to civil war in Syria. It's all layered. It's impossible to pry apart, right? Um, but you know, if we think about the UK, which is the example you raised, I mean, the, 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 those images uh, that were used by the Brexiteers, right, of just floods of people coming into England and all this scary stuff, which was a precursor to the way Trump used the caravan invasion in the, in, in the midterm election. And this is what we're looking towards. And, it, and, and I think this is, it's also important to be honest that we are no longer talking about avoiding climate change, right? We are right. in it and we've already locked in more of it. So even if we do this Herculean tra transition, we are facing a future where um, we are gonna have to figure out how to live together in a different way. And the core question that we face is whether we believe that human life has value, that all human beings have equal value, right? And if we don't have that deep shift in values, then we are gonna be seeing a fortressing of even more of a fortressing and militarizing and privatizing of that fortressing and militarizing of borders, at, like we're seeing in Europe, like we're seeing in North America, like we're seeing in Australia. Um, so this shift to a different kind of economy that says, you know, your life has value because you are a, you are a human being. That's why you have a right to health care. That's why you have a right to housing. Um, that's why you have a, a right to clean air and clean water. Um, that is the core values shift that will govern whether or not we will face the shocks ahead um, with, with humanity or barbarism, right? So that's beautifully put. Um, I don't, I'm not quite sure where the uh, microphone is up front, so yep. Shayla, crisp, Hi. crisp questions. Shayla we Nelson can move Stewart, along. One Earth, One Voice campaign. Thank you all so much, and thank you all for being here. I have a question for the entire panel, and first a question for everybody in this room and those of you who are tuned into the live feed. I'd like to see a show of hands. How many of you have been directly impacted or know someone directly impacted by a climate event? Could I see a show of hands? Even a few years ago, in meetings that Bill and I have attended together, we would have seen fewer hands than that. And that was almost, for those of you who can't see, that was almost every single hand, if not every single hand in this room. 
the Green New Deal provides us with an opportunity to create a sense of urgency and a message point, which I think we've been missing. Question. And the question is, among all of you, can you empower this gathering of exceptional communicators and storytellers with the quickest heartfelt phrases or sentences that give us something to say when people say, the climate issue is too complex, the climate issue is too unwieldy, Good. it's too costly. Can you give Abdul, us some, you're, some sound bites? You're fresh off the campaign trail, so <laughs> sound bites are you. Uh, uh, you take the first crack at this. <laughs> I was a, I, I lived in Florida for some time, and uh, five days after my little brother was born, Hurricane Andrew hit. And, um, and I remember walking out of my house, and it looked like a war had happened overnight. Uh, I was eight years old, and I didn't quite appreciate how serious it was until um, I saw my dad um, afraid. And, you know, when you're eight, your dad is Superman, right? Um, and... Superman was afraid, um, and Superman doesn't get afraid. He puts his, cap, his cape on, and he goes and fights the fight, right? Um, but Superman was very afraid. Um, and uh, my five-day-old brother, thankfully, slept through the night. For me, the moments that were most meaningful in communicating to folks who didn't already have an ideological preset around this issue was about asking them to put themselves in the shoes of somebody who's had their life turned upside down and then connecting it to a moment or a crisis that's just around the way. So for folks in communities across Michigan, the Flint water crisis was that. It was saying, imagine you had been brushing your kid's teeth and bathing your child in water that was leaded and asking yourself every single day about whether or not the consequences of that will hurt your kid's life potential. Imagine you're one of the folks who's got PFAS in your water and all of a sudden every year you've got to go to a doctor and get a chest x-ray because it might just be that you had cancer. Imagine being that person who lives on the coast or even close to the coast when line five splits open and poisons the Great Lakes water. That's not that far away. And those are the feelings it would feel like. For me, it was being able to connect folks to that experience and having them even walk for a moment through the trauma that exists for people who've gone through that every single day, right? And, um, and when you get people close to that and you ask them to, to see the humanity in those people who are suffering that, they're not just the people on CNN running away from the Paradise Fire, they, they are you, they are your parents, they are your sisters and your brothers, they are your kids. Um, those are the moments where it happens for them. And once it happens for them, that's empathy, right? Once that empathy comes into the context, into the setting, then this is not a question about abstract ideas. Because again, great policy is about actually situating on people, and great politics is about getting people to see themselves in those people. Dude, you're good at this. You gotta run for some more stuff. <laughs> uh, uh, let's, we've only got a few minutes. Let's try to get a few more questions in here. I still don't know how we're, where the microphone, how, okay, good. Hi, um, my name is Genevieve and I'm from Canada. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask you all to speak a bit about the importance of centering um, Indigenous resistance specifically mm. uh, when it comes to the climate crisis and talking about how kind of the struggle for uh, environmental justice is very much inseparable from respecting Indigenous treaty rights both here in, in the US and yeah, Canada that's a, and a, that's across a the world. Super important question and I'm glad you raised it. I'll talk for a second about it and then well, I mean, I think the single most important th and, and exciting thing that's happened in the climate movement over the last decade has been that indigenous communities have moved right to the front of it. And that's super important for a couple of reasons. One, all around the world, certainly in North America, uh, there were an awful lot of cases where we exiled indigenous people off to places that we thought were of no value to anyone. And ha ha, it just turns out that they're um, sitting on top of large quantities of carbon or astride the places through which you need to run pipelines, et cetera, to get it out. And hence, their sovereignty and, and power has proved enormously important. Uh, uh, and, and it's been really inspiring to be sort of parts of those fights up in the tar sands at Standing Rock, wherever it is. Uh, second thing is, it's really, really important 
that the oldest wisdom traditions on this planet are now meshing up kind of perfectly with the newest wisdom traditions on the planet, i.e. the kind of vision from the sweat lodge and the vision from the satellite and the supercomputer are mesh up very powerfully here. And both of them uh, 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 are at odds with the vision that's governed our uh, civilization for the last 50 or 100 years, um, this vision of endless constant growth about in every corner and that kind of thing. So I think that's super key. Naomi, you've done tons of work with indigenous communities in Canada and elsewhere. Um, well, well I, I, th uh, this is p part of how I was going to answer the last question about just a succinct phrase. Um, I was going to quote uh, a friend of mine named Crystal Lehman um, mm. with uh, the Beaver Lake Cree First Nation and a, a tar climate sands. activist and anti-tar sands activist, but now working on solar, bringing solar and, uh, uh, to her community. And uh, she's in This Changes Everything, uh, the film and the book. And she's, what she says is if you, um, if you breathe air, uh, if, uh, and if you drink water, this is about you, <laughs> um, which was our, our little tagline. Um, but you know, the person I learned the most uh, about this from was a, uh, a great man who died two years ago named Arthur Manuel. Um, and he's written a couple books, um, it most, uh, one published posthumously called The Reconciliation Manifesto. Um, and a lot of it is about how it, respecting indigenous rights, including fully implementing the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, is the pathway to stopping catastrophic climate change. Because when the indigenous rights are respected um, and enforced, which can't happen without real support and real coalition work, um, then those pipelines can't be built. Um, and that th those mega mines can't be built. But that isn't only about aligning and supporting um, with indigenous people when they are fighting the pipeline and when they are um, trying to stop the, the, the mine, but also when they're trying to bring clean water to their communities and healthcare to their communities yeah. so they aren't forced into these Faustian bargains of let's sign you know, uh, an agreement with Enbridge or Kinder Morgan so that you get you know, uh, a, a few thousand dollars to be able to you know, build a health clinic because those are the types of choices that indigenous communities are being forced into. Um, so, uh, yeah. Who's got the microphone now? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I'm Gus Newport. I was the former mayor of Berkeley, California. Hey. There, I, I just want to say, the Green New Deal is a beautiful term. But understand, we think of it that because we think of the New Deal. And it begs caution because the New Deal brought us some real problems. I had the fortune to work with people who worked on the New Deal when I was mayor because we were pursuing an alternative economy. Redlining came out of the New Deal. Mm -hmm. And when you stop and think about the conditions of blacks and Latinos and people now, during the predatory lending crisis of 2008, 70% of people of color's wealth got wiped out. And recent statistics suggest it would take 280 years if we started from baseline to get back. Yeah. On top of that, we're 37th in the world in education now. Mm -hmm. Our education has got it so that all people can be a part of. Little old Cuba, who we've kept a clamp on forever, their illiteracy rate is 0.1%. So we need to have a broad vision to do this. I want it, I want to applaud Naomi and other people who've come up with this. I want to know more about it. It's a part of what we need to do because we don't want to just base the future on finance because without the environment, everything else is for naught. But let's think this through clearly and include all people, all races, all kinds and whatever else in this process. Don't just go on it by yourself, which has caused the diminishing of our educational situation right now and everything else. And I applaud you for what Amen. you're doing. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Dale, do we have time for another question or not? Hello, everyone. Um, I see hundreds of Americas in walled gardens or walled places in our constituencies, in our communities, in our movements. 
we all appreciate that intersectionality is one of the big answers here, right? How do we accelerate that process of communication that we need because we're in an emergency? We talk about it. How do we actually go out and do it? What, what do you all think? Matt? Well, I, and this goes back to the question around indigenous leadership. You know, I indigenous communities in the United States are not only on the front lines, but they're winning. You know, Winona LaDuke is, can't be here today, who's going to be on this panel, because she's winning. <laughs> she is taking out these pipelines, winning, doing amazing work. So people should, should check that out. I think that, that in, investing in culture is, is where I come back to in a lot of ways. And, and part of what that means is mm -hmm. investing in, in, in storytelling, investing in, in people who can tell those stories, mm -hmm. investing in artists and culture makers yeah. and musicians <laughs> and making this an actual social, social movement that we can be proud of. And I think that's the way to, to get out and, and to, to get into this. And I also think that, um, that ooh, yeah, that's, I mean, the, so much of this is a big question. But I, just from what you said, that we see these communities, which means we're in proximity to them, which also means that, that, that in most places, you're also in proximity to frontline social movements. And people have to go and understand and go and, and bear witness, go and, and, and learn. I think that it. That, that it's about leaning into this new potential for a social movement and social transformation in a way that, that then let's see. I think the other thing that needs to be invested in is in, um, is in uh, 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 experiments, like bold, risk-taking things that are invested in, 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 in culture-making space in other places. And let's see what shakes out, improve upon them, expand them, but, but I, th I think we're, we're only going to get there through innovation and, and thinking in ways that we haven't before. Stephanie, you had something to add here. Oh, I was just going to add that we are going to have, uh, Senator Sanders is hosting a climate town hall here in just a few nights. And so that's another opportunity to have this conversation uh, at, at the national level and maybe not just talk about a Green New Deal, but I think it's important, we've heard it again and again, it's not a Green New Deal, it's a green and a black and a brown and a red and a yellow and a orange, maybe not orange, but <laughs> mostly. And, I, and I, so I think that's a, a way to keep forcing this into the, into the public domain, into the conversation, and we're going to have an opportunity in just a few nights to hear big thinkers that's talk right. about this issue. Right? That's a, actually a good, since we're, we're getting the sign that it's time to come to an end, that's a good place. There'll be a Facebook Live discussion on Monday night at 7. Um, um, so all of you who still have not yet deleted your Facebook account can uh, <laughs> uh, take part. I'll, I'll just end, maybe I'll just take the moderator's prerogative to end, Josh, that's a good question, and say that part of the answer is, and this is one of the reasons, I mean, it's really important that we work on electoral politics and we work on policy stuff and things, but it's important to remember that that's not the only kind of politics mm. that there is, and that so much that's happened in the last decade uh, to build the climate movement that's gotten us to the point where we can start talking about this and to build it in a really intersectional way mm -hmm. has come because people have been willing to get involved in actual battles on the ground against bad things and in favor of good ones. And it's when we actually have a fight at hand that we really learn how to work together well. Uh, that some of those people's stuff drops away, we get focused on who needs to be out front and how it's going to work. And, and so um, this discussion that we've had about the Green New Deal is really exciting and really important and should give us a great deal of hope. And it's also folded, it's also part of an ongoing daily struggle that we need to keep engaged in because that's been the roots of where we are now and that's one of the ways that I think we're going to build the scale of movement that we need going forward. I do think that one thing that's come out of this panel, at least I hope, is that as people, and this is a concrete thing, as people are running for office and talking about it and everything else, 
that the three things now that people are going to tick off every time they talk about it is a $15 an hour minimum wage, Medicare for all, and a Green New Deal. This is right and up no there now money. with those things. And no corporate money. There you go. Thank you all very much.